Okay, terrific. And we are now live. Well, thank you all so much for being here tonight. Tonight, I am joined by Ravi Shankar and Tim Tomlinson to talk about Dr. Shankar's memoir, Correctional. A little bit about Ravi and Tim before we begin. Dr. Ravi Shankar is a Pushcart Prize winning poet, translator, and professor who has published over 15 books, including the Muse India Award winning translations, And All, The Autobiography of a Goddess, and The Many Uses of Mint, New and Selected Poems, 1997 to 2017. Along with Tina Chang and Natalie Handel, he co edited W.W. Norton's Language for a New Century. Contemporary Poetry from the Middle East, Asia, and Beyond, called a beautiful achievement for world literature by Nobel laureate Nadine Gordimer. He has taught and performed around the world and appeared in print, radio, and TV in such venues as the New York Times, NPR, BBC, and the PBS NewsHour. He has won awards to the Corporation of Yaddo and the McDowell Colony, fellowships from the Rhode Island and Connecticut Council on the Arts, founded one of the oldest electronic journals of the arts, Drunken Boat, is chairman of the Asia Pacific Writers and Translators, and recently finished his PhD from the University of Sydney. His memoir, Correctional, is forthcoming in 2022 with University of Wisconsin Press. Tim Tomlinson was born in Brooklyn, raised on Long Island, where he was educated by jukeboxes and juvenile delinquents. He is a professor of writing at New York University's Global Liberal Studies Program. He is a co-founder of New York Writers Workshop and co-author of its popular text, The Portable MFA in Creative Writing. He is the author of the chapbook Yolanda, an oral history and verse, the poetry collection, Requiem for the Tree Fort I Set on Fire, and the collection of short fiction, This Is Not Happening to You. Um, I also want to give a shout out to our partners for this event. This event is part of the 24th annual Utah Humanities Book Festival. This annual free festival is the Utah Humanities gift to the community, allowing us to explore all sorts of ideas by interacting with great writers. The complete program is available at utahhumanities.org. Our thanks to the book festival's major sponsors, George S. and Dolores Dorr Eccles Foundation, Salt Lake City Arts Council, Salt Lake County Zoo Arts and Parks Fund, Summit County Rep, Weber County Ramp, the Charles Red Center for Western Studies, the King's English Bookshop, Weller Bookworks, the National Endowment for the Humanities, the National Endowment for the Arts and Catalyst. We're gonna be ending tonight's discussion with a 10 to 15 minute Q&A. So if you have any questions, drop them in the YouTube chat box and I'll make sure they get asked. Um, and finally, if you enjoy this conversation, please consider supporting Dr. Shanker by buying his book, and please consider supporting our bookstore by buying it through us. It won't be out until January 4th of 2022, but I'll leave links where you can pre-order it in the YouTube description and chat box, and we'll also have signed book plates. Um, and without further ado, I will now turn the time over to the two of them. Thank you both so much for being here. Thank you very much, Salem, for the warm introduction. Um, and I want to uh, just uh, get in before we move on. Uh, don't forget to support Tim Tomlinson too and buy This Is Not Happening to You, which is already available. Um, uh, Ravi, do you want to say anything before we just get right into the discussion? Uh, well, I, I will just say I, I want to uh, thank the Weller Bookstore and, and the Utah Festival. I will be out in Utah uh, November 15th to 17th to do a couple of in-person events as part of the uh, Festival of the Humanities. And um, just a shout out to um, uh, Lissa Warren and Samuel Haker, uh, who are the publicists who are working with me to set all of this up in University of Wisconsin Press. It's kind of strange doing all these launches, not having a hard copy, but uh, there is an ebook, and I hope that you will support your local indie bookstore and uh, get a copy from Weller Bookstore today. So uh, it's great to be with you, Tim. And great to be here with you. Um, I'm uh, <clears throat> delighted to have a chance to talk to you about this book. Um, uh, it, as I was thinking about how we might begin tonight, uh, it, it occurred to me that uh, I have read uh, a much earlier version, uh, probably about three years ago, um, and I remember telling you how wonderful I thought that draft was, uh, how I think we both agreed that there were things that needed to happen in order to turn it around into something to put finally between covers, and I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about 
that revision process. It's been a long journey. Um, and I know that the book is somewhat transformed. And I'm wondering how much has changed? What did you do? How did you go into that revision process? Revision in general? Take it away, Ravi. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, I'm uh, constitutionally a poet and the, the poetic revision process, though intensive, is quite different than revising prose. And, uh, you know, I, there were really uh, six major uh, revisions of the book. Um, and mm -hmm. in each case, I put the book aside for maybe, you know, four or five months. I mean, there, between a couple of revisions, I, I didn't know if I could even really finish it. I was grappling with a lot of difficult things. And I think those early drafts, um, and uh, you, you saw it about three years ago, but I, I think I still had a certain defensive posture. I think I was still really bitter in some ways. I hadn't really processed fully all of my uh, experiences. Um, and then, um, you know, the great thing about going with an academic uh, publisher is that you have to go through this double blind peer review process where they send it out to reviewers to give you feedback. And I actually got some terrific feedback from, from both readers, both of whom really liked it, but noticed a couple of things uh, for example, um, I, uh, in, in this latest version, I'm a little bit more uh, critical of um, uh, Hindu nationalism, which exists in India. Um, I also uh, implemented this narrative structure, which we can maybe talk about later, but I have these six uh, epistles, these letters to people in my life. And that was something that I came upon very late, uh, actually in conversation with my partner, Julie Batten, whose birthday it is today. Happy birthday, Julie. Um, but uh, that provided this almost a scaffolding for me to put in because there the book ranges around chronologically, not just in my life, but my parents' life, even a little bit about my uh, grandfather, who was a journalist for the Hindu uh, in the 1940s and covered partition in India uh, when it, um, Pakistan and India were being uh, separated. And um, these letters, I think, um, are a way for my more intimate voice. It's kind of a direct address to the people I love and to also to the universe in some ways. And that element, I think, has really transformed it, added another dimension. Uh, and that came very late in the process. And then finally, uh, the epilogue. I, I had to kind of write an epilogue, uh, particularly in light of a lot of what I was writing about uh, has, you know, since uh, George Floyd, uh, and um, a lot of what happened last summer, um, I had to kind of um, reflect on. Uh, and so I, I, I think that last chapter, um, I did have enough kind of distance and I was able to talk about not just that, the Me Too movement and um, all kinds of different issues in that final epilogue. And so that, that was a major difference as well. I noticed that I read the epilogue this afternoon, uh, quite moving. Um, as I'm looking at you and thinking about uh, our two different trajectories, mm -hmm. if I had to, because you, you seem to have been enormously accomplished and uh, on track toward uh, early and significant success, uh, at both institutional and creative, whereas I felt, I feel looking back at my own life that I was headed to jail. Mm -hmm. uh, I. <laughs> I avoided prison and somehow you wound up there. And I, I, I wonder, can you tell us a little bit about um, what does the reader need to know about your, your family history and your background to understand how, what, what a twist that was, what a pivot that became for you in your understanding of where you are now? Yeah, and, and it is uh, certainly unfathomable for uh, my family, which was a, a, a South Asian Tamilian Brahmin family who uh, certainly valued uh, education and respect for the law. Uh, and, um, you know, in, in one of the discussions I've been having, uh, and Nick Flynn noticed that there are these two threads that run in the book, which are both one of uh, this idea of Brahmin exceptionalism that I was kind of raised with. And some of you know a little bit about the caste system in India. Um, but uh, Brahmins, of course, who invented the caste system were kind of the, the top, the scholars, um, and the sense of marginalization that I felt very deeply um, growing up in Northern Virginia and trying to assimilate into the school. And it, it's almost like uh, both of these rail, rails were running next to each other. And there was this third dangerous rail that was also there, omnipresent throughout that I was unaware of uh, in, in, in some way. And, you know, I, I I, I do think that um, 
uh, things probably came a little bit too easily to me. I mean, I got my first teaching position because the former inaugural poet Richard Blanco, his, who's a friend, uh, fell in love and absconded uh, with his lover to Florida. He left this um, open position at Central um, and I was hired on an emergency appointment uh, uh, on a tenure track line prior to publishing my first book of poems. So that was immensely lucky uh, for sure. And then um, after that, I, you, you're right, I did uh, certainly um, uh, work very hard, but I was the uh, youngest tenured professor in the history of Central Connecticut State University. and. Uh, I think that what all of that steaming ahead in terms of my career was doing was I wasn't really in touch with the um, unresolved issues from my family, from, from my relationship, from the sense of this bifurcated identity of someone who didn't really fit in and always felt he had to project a, a particular face in order to, to succeed. And, and to a certain extent, that worked. It worked up to a certain point where all of a sudden, everything shattered. And of course, um, the one thing I'll say about the book, it, it talks about different encounters I had with the criminal justice system. And that first time I was totally innocent and, uh, you know, I was caught up in a, a stop and frisk by the NYPD. And I think after that, there also was some kind of um, psychic resonance that I didn't really understand that changed my relationship. I well, I think I was paranoid. I was a little pissed off. I got more reckless. You know, I've always been a little bit of an anarchist, certainly. Um, but then these things happened in a simultaneous fashion. And so that these, these things, one after another, over the course of just a couple of years, happened almost with a momentum that I didn't even understand and overtook me. Uh, and I guess this book is about that process of wrangling with... Um, how, as you said, I mean, how in the middle of this very successful life could I take a wrecking ball to my career, my family, my home, my community? Um, what did I, what did that mean? You know, paradoxically, on the other side of it, I'm, you know, a much happier person. I think I'm a more fully realized person. Uh, I don't know if I would have got there if it wasn't for that really dark period that I detail in correctional. Yeah, I, I'm wondering the about the, um, the the strategy behind telling the story because it's it's both uh, a family history, it's a personal memoir, and it's an analysis of the U.S. carceral system. When did you know that it had to be both of those things? Well, I I, I think the moment uh, that um, I knew that I had to do 90 days and um, the way that I uh, realized that I would survive was simply by imagining myself an immersion journalist that it was covering all of these things. And what I realized, all of the expectations I had about what a correctional facility would be like were uh, overturned uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, I found actually a great human humanity and emotional complexity and I met these men, and I can maybe uh, share a little bit about some of them, but they shared with me um, these stories of their lives and their dreams and their hardships. And they made me, they said, you know, you, you have a voice outside. We, we don't have a voice. I mean, society has just basically discarded us. And, you know, we've told you these stories and can you, we want you to do something with that. And that was a moment when I, I made a promise to them that I would do something. I knew that, okay, I have to, to follow through and I need to tell these stories. Um, and while in the process of telling these stories and telling my own story, I realized that this wasn't just a correction of myself, but it was uh, exposing me to what I knew theoretically that uh, there are the criminal justice system uh, in every sense, not just the system of an uh, carceral system, but the legal system, the system of probation and parole that exists afterwards, re-entry, rehabilitation, all of these things are deeply flawed and broken and that I couldn't tell my own story without also revealing some of those uh, structural flaws that I experienced firsthand. Um, and, you know, I was really deeply moved by uh, being accepted by some of these men who I probably in my normal life would never even have encountered. I mean, if we passed each other on the street, we, you know, we, we wouldn't even have said hello. And yet, because we were forced to do this time, um, we got to know each other. And uh, I think that's uh, part of the reason that I had to write the book. Did you enter uh, the 90 day experience with uh, trepidation and fear uh, and, and then feel that that was being slowly 
transformed because of the, the, the sense you were getting of these exceptional people? Yeah, I mean, I certainly, I mean, the only uh, knowledge I had of uh, jail was uh, shows like Oz and Prison Break and like, you know, uh, definitely uh, was very afraid. Uh, and um, I wasn't in a cell. I was in a dorm with 60 other men. Um, you know, there were moments I saw some fights that I detail, uh, you know, the dorm was pepper sprayed at one point, And there was one moment where I was actually physically imperiled. Um, but by and large, that was uh, the exception. Um, I, I initially, I didn't talk to anyone. I wanted to melt into the wall. Uh, I didn't want to be seen. Uh, I just wanted to be a fly on the wall observing. And I thought, you know, I can just, but you're in a community of people and there is nothing to do because there is no uh, school rehabilitation, counseling, you know, anything to make these men do anything better, but you're just sitting around wasting your time, you know, playing cards, playing chess, but just bullshitting, talking about various stories. And, uh, you know, in that I got to, I slowly, my own um, presuppositions and my stereotypes of these men slowly started to dissolve. It was like, oh, well, one of them is smoking a joint and got arrested when he was 16. And after that, he had a family, he had a baby mom. So he had to take care of his child. He couldn't get a job. He had a criminal record, uh, you know, and every time he has got done time in prison, he has to start all over. Everything he's built has been raised and abolished. Uh, you know, I met someone else who was a, a tax attorney that had a, a substance uh, abuse problem, but didn't belong in jail. Um, so yes, I think that, um, the, these stories um, made me realize that these guys are not, you know, that different than me. And, and then they were. I mean, that's, I think, what is maybe a little bit unique about correctional is that I tell the story from both sides of the fence, from someone who has uh, been the recipient and beneficiary of enormous privilege throughout my entire life, and someone who has also been discriminated against and harassed because of my ethnicity and the color of my skin. Uh, and I, I, I think I tell both of those stories, but uh, yeah, so uh, some of the men I think are, uh, I will never forget. And I hope I'm trying to get the, some of these men to see the book, um, but it, it's been hard to kind of track them down. But uh, yeah, I do write about them pretty intensively in the book. Well, it sounds like another uh, uh, great good fortune was their encouragement for you to tell their story. Because that always gets into some dicey uh, areas. We were talking about this last night in reference to the, the Don Derland, uh, Sonia Larson uh, appropriation. But you were actually uh, sent out uh, with the hope that you would give voice to the stories of these people. I wonder if now might be a good time to, uh, to share some of the, the book with us so we can hear how you accommodate their stories and maybe hear their voices. Sure. Yeah. Now I will start. This is, um, you know, uh, and I, you know, had to do ultimately 90 days as a pretrial detention to satisfy the state. What a nefarious phrase. And uh, um, it was split up over the course of about a year and a half. And so this chapter I'm going to read from Chaos Theory, you know, comes, um, you know, pro probably a, a good uh, 45 days or so into my sentence, which was split up. I, you know, that was the longest stretch I had to do at one, any one time. And uh, um, I'll just begin right in the middle of this chapter. One day, Junkie John tells me about his own family while describing the hungry and homeless hustle he had going during the summertime. If I could have kept that going, I would have never boosted like I did. The shoplifting boosted. Uh, could have been a method actor. All I needed was a piece of cardboard and a Sharpie. Write some heartwarming message about being a vet or homeless or God have mercy on my soul BS. Then I camp off the exit ramp at a place like Coles or Hex. He stops to ponder for a moment. Never Macy's nor Nordstrom's. The patrons there too stuck up. I'd stand there with my shirt off. He points to a sallow sunken chest and one look at me and they know I hadn't eaten in a week. Never mind, it's because I'm a junkie. I show them the skeleton man, even put some real hunger pangs into my eyes. Broke their hearts every time. I had housewives giving me cold cuts, bread, bananas, gift cards, water bottles, you name it. Some ladies took me out to lunch. A businessman bought me a bike so I wouldn't have to walk from home. 
people are unbelievable. They see what they want to see in you. I would have stayed all summer, but got hit with, with a town ordinance by the cops. Two months later, and I'm back with my crazy ex, boosting now more than ever. He's got nothing to show for it now, of course. As soon as he was done in Hartford, he would walk the few blocks to Clay Hill or Frog Hollow to cop some smack to shoot up in his arm and some crack to put in his pipe. Like Smurf, another inmate we meet, he is unrepentant when, it, when he describes his drug use. Drugs make him feel alive. Give him a purpose. They allow him to play the numbers, bone his girl, not in and out of delirious ecstasy. He needs the crack to get wired and the smack to sleep. That's what a lick is. Nothing else matters but getting high. I'm a no good lick, Robbie, John tells me. I'm someone who had it all. I come from good stock, solid people like you. You're from old Saybrook. You know what I'm talking about. My mother was in insurance. My brother was an investment banker. We vacationed out in the Cape. Uh, I'm not like these guys in here. You're not like them either. We don't belong in here. He leans in conspiratorially as we walk up and down the length of the dorm. These other guys, the ones you hear and talk and lick this and lick that, well, screw them. They wouldn't have a penny for diapers, let alone rims for their rides if it wasn't for us licks. We keep them in business. We buy their products. Yeah, that's right. Without us, they're nothing. So how dare they come in here, in here. His voice rises to a squeal as he points around the day room walk into my fucking home, disrespecting me like I'm some kind of derelict, no good, super brained, dirty, sniveling, junky crackhead. Because without me, they're nothing. I'm middle class, Robbie. Hyannisport, Cape Cod, even been to South Africa, had a girl out there. John pauses his monologue and looks at me. I find the vulnerability in his eyes disarming. You know why they call us licks, don't you? Because we're so desperate, we'd lick that last little bit of anything. Some coke off a mirror, some dust from a bag, some aerosol spray foam, lick it right off the floor to get that last little high. We touched something too beautiful for this world. So what? Who are they? Talking about their baby mamas and their sweet rides that they got because of us. At least we know who we are. John, man, come on. You, you can kick that habit. You're a smart guy. Come clean. A lick is what a, a lick knows what a lick knows, just like a dick is what a dick is. Thanks anyway, professor. He uses a phony French accent and turns away from me. Entertaining as he is, I'm thankful that Junkie John is not my cube mate. I have, however, gained two other cubies. Leonard, a white, fat, bearded neocon lawnmower repairman, and Chaos, born Kendrick Krauss. Chaos grew up in and out of foster care. Now he's a bald-headed black man with a prominently missing tooth, also undeniably a lick. He's the sort of guy you'd instinctively shimmy away from on the sidewalk, and he'd be right to do so because he's a self-avowed vicious crackhead. Licks are at the bottom of the prison social system. The only factions lower are the rapists and the pedophiles. Chaos was a kleptomaniac junkie and drug dealer, which constituted a sort of lower middle class in prison. The ones at the top of the pecking order were the ones in for homicide or money laundering. Upon meeting me, chaos starts up immediately. I'll stab your mama in the back for a dollar. Remember that about me? Don't say I didn't warn you. I have no trouble believing him for I've seen him drop kick the board during a chess game. Chaos happens to be the best chess player I've seen since OG. He plays with blazing speed and when he's playing Tio, they both slam their pieces down in a ritual dance that dazzles the eye. It's only after the opening has been set that he slows down to consider his moves, but even then he places pieces in synaptic bursts. He's only lost one game since he's been in here, and that time he flipped the board and pinned the kid he was playing by the throat. Maybe that's the reason OG refused to play him. He's the kind of guy who borrow your chessboard and bark at you later because one of your own pieces gone when he had it last, OG tells me. No, nah, thanks. Not for me. This makes me sad for I desperately want to see chaos and OG go at it. They're contrasting styles like an irresistible force against an unmovable object. Unfortunately, the discussion is a non-starter. Chaos doesn't have a lot of friends because he is a straight up hustler. He gets up before everyone so that he's first in line for breakfast, scarfs down his tray, and he gets right back into the end of the line with the stragglers for a second serve and right under the eye of the watchful CO. 
He trades items for people, always taking a cut for himself. He has junkie buddies all up and down the correctional facility. Even brags that he once had a laptop and a burner phone brought to him when he was at Gates. Back there, he brags, I charge one soup a minute to use that thing. If you engage in a conversation with him, it's likely that you'll be taken for something. Sometimes, however, it can be avoided. How a fuck a guy like you end up in here? A DUI, I tell him. Driving on a suspended license, a probation violation. You a Pocky? Stay home with a little Mrs. Pocky. Can't have you coming in here fraternizing with my kind. Who gonna own up their motels and gas stations if not for you, Pocky? My parents are Indian. I was born in Washington, D.C. I'm a teacher. I'll let you know if I get lucky enough to own anything. Don't you be rolling up on Park Street, Pocky, and don't let me catch you back there trying to buy some rock. You hear me? He chuckles. Keep your swerving ass back home. Now let me grab some soup off you. His patter and devious ways don't engender a lot of goodwill from his fellow inmates who often complain about him behind his back. Like many of these men, he spent the great majority of his adult life inside these kinds of facilities. He's also prone to spontaneous rages and will explode at someone's ignorance, even his own. He's on some serious medication and is always first in line when Stevens calls the men to come out and get your Skittles. Because I haven't hardened my heart adequately. I make the mistake of lending chaos my radio one day. And now he comes over each morning to borrow just a splash of coffee to start his day. Leonard and Chaos don't get along. I like Lenny, though. He's a real salt of the earth type. He's in here for repeatedly hunting and fishing without a license. He runs a small appliance and lawnmower repair shop in Granby. He lost the hearing in his right ear in Vietnam. and the end of his tour of duty, his wife dumped him. Now he's alone and embittered. Lenny suffers from what in retrospect were surprisingly prescient apocalyptic visions of the future involving super viruses and climate triggered earthquakes. He also esteems Ronald Reagan as a personal hero, which makes me avoid politics with him. Instead, we sit and play rummy hand after hand while he worries about his arthritic father and his deadhead son. Lenny, Lenny doesn't blame anyone but himself for his troubles, unlike many of the others he sees and scorns. He's particularly galled by chaos, who loafs around, borrows everything, and would steal and lie right to his face. You know, once you start, he's not going to stop with the begging, don't you? Leonard asks, playing kings. I grimace and nod. You're too nice. You don't see me giving out buttski. The next day, chaos sees me winning at chess against Doma and starts to comment. You smooth professor, don't think I don't see you. You got your own hustle going. You can't fool me, selling coffee balls and winning at cards. You're going to do all right up in here. But you don't belong with us, garbage. This is real talk. You know why they call me chaos? Because disaster follows me. I tore up my mom real bad coming out of her pussy, so she left me on the church steps. My grandma raised me, but I stole her earmuffs as soon as I could walk. Pawned off her jewelry. She loved me, but I got arrested too many times. Chaos has grown very emotional in his telling. He's tough, but completely thin-skinned. His face is a living mirror for everything he's going through, from hunger pangs to devious plotting, from rage to utter chest focus. Now his face has transformed in an anguish that wraps itself around me by making his grief into that of a little boy's. Somehow Chaos's contorted face makes me miss and fear for my own daughters. I feel that he's loosen the plank in the wall I've constructed to keep myself uncontaminated by these men. I'm sorry that the world has done, to this, to, done this to people like him. I try to tell chaos, but he shakes me off. Chaos, garbage, that's what it means. That's what got me locked up the first time. That's what got me locked up the last. All the times in between, well, when I show up, just goes bananas. Got the name chaos during 4th of July cookout. Cracker tried to big time me, so I tied a bunch of fireworks to his propane gill. Well, grill, when it lit off, the whole sky glowed a hundred different colors. Colors between the colors. Then a shooting, and then after that, everyone called me chaos. Unpredictable. Disorder. Disaster. I'm a demon. And when he looks at me, I believe him. I see a fiend flashing hate in his eyes, and his visage has been transformed into one of those Tibetan masks like the leering Mahakala, the personal tutelary of Kublai Khan. He glares venom. But really, I'm garbage, swear to you. True talk. I'll steal a ring off a dead man's finger and pawn it for a dime bag. I'll sell black bags and bricks of coke and dirty needles to little kids in school zones. I'll blaze a police chief down just for looking at my girl. No hesitation. 
I want to be this way, but I can't help but swear to God. I raise myself and I'm a piece of filth. Chaos goes silent then. His animated face is placid as the surface of a lake that has stopped rippling in the wind. I find myself soaked by the torrent of his words as, I've been as if I've been standing in a storm without an umbrella. And I'll stop there. It goes on, of course, to, to talk about these men and, and what I learned about them. Uh, quite wonderful, Ravi. Thank you very much. Um, as you're reading, I'm, I'm appreciating the, the quality of the prose. And I'm also thinking that the, the book is, um, uh, th there are two significant components. One is, I think, the, the excellence of the writing. So it's a writerly book. And the other is the inherent interest in the subject. And I think very often when writers have a great meaty social issue subject, they get asked about that almost exclusively mm. uh, and the writing gets uh, pushed to the side. I'd like to ask you a question about the writing and then a question about the subject. I think they're both really important components of the book. So in reference to the writing, um, you're a poet. Um, and prose is a whole different game. Uh, I wonder how you uh, uh, achieve the temerity to enter into this new endeavor. Uh, and if you had any models, either for the book or for your prose writing, is there some, I know that you have the, um, the epigraph from Ralph Ellison, uh, you know, what kind of, who, who informs the book for you? Yeah. Uh, and yes, uh, I, I am a poet constitutionally, and I think there's a certain lyric quality, but I had to work very hard to, to master some of these larger contrivances of plot and, and dialogue. Some of the dialogue, I have to say, because I kept these notebooks um, while I was there, just wrote down as much as I could hear. I would eavesdrop. I would listen to what people were saying. And I just had pages filled with slang and diet, all kinds of bureaucratic speak, uh, the, the CO's uh, language, the banned books. And so I had this kind of material to use. Um, but then, uh, you know, how to kind of tell this story um, in a way uh, that uh, is kind of a page turner. And that was really difficult because the thing about prose is uh, it always has to to stay moving and moving forward. And uh, as a poet, I could describe the, you know, the, the space I was in to the nth degree. I could give you the best kind of metaphor for uh, the, uh, the smell and the odor. But, you know, in, in prose, you're telling uh, a story and it, it, it requires a, a whole different kind of attention to both language uh, and a contract with the reader. And um, I, I, I suppose I read a lot of, memoir in, in preparation, certainly uh, James Baldwin and Ellison. Uh, a, a big influence was uh, Tainishi Coates, Between the World and Me, particularly the fact that it was epistolary and addressed to his son gave me some of the idea uh, for including letters of my own. Um, uh, I um, also um, uh, read memoirs that I really admire, like Mary Carr and um, Tobias Wolf, and I wanted to kind of get a sense of uh, how are you? Uh, how is this story being told? Um, because it's it's true, and uh, uh, you know everything that I re recount is true as as far as I can remember it. But the art of memoir is really in what you choose to leave out. What is excised? Um, what moments do you choose to focus in on and magnify? Uh, where is the exposition? Where is the scene? And what is the ratio between them? Um, and these were all considerations that I never would think about writing a, a poem. I might be worried about a syllable count or lineation or a form I was working in, but um, these larger ideas, and my hope is that um, there's a kind of a accumulating power to the narrative that um, as we go forward, uh, it hopes in some way to really kind of crack our uh, heart open. You know, that is a, a ambitious goal, but I, that's one that I, I set for myself in re revising the book. Well, I think the passage that you just read does that. Um, uh, the, the humanity of chaos uh, comes through quite beautifully. The vernacular, uh, I was hearing echoes of David Wojnarowicz and Tom Waits. Uh, so um, you, I think you achieve 
mm-hmm. on that score. But in, in reference to the subject, uh, what do you know now about race in America? What do you know now about the, the U.S. criminal justice system uh, that you didn't know before this sequence of events began? Mm. Well, I mean, I think part of it is um, the the quality of knowledge, right? So you can know something and then you can know something. And so um, part of what I knew theoretically and statistically about the racial disparity of incarceration experiencing it firsthand made me realize really uh, uh, how true it was. Um, And I also, it made me really uh, both um, be aware of... um, how uh, I had benefited in a lot of ways, but then I, I, I write about, I was living in New York, as, as I know, uh, Tim, you've lived in New York for most of your, a lot of your life. And um, I was in New York for, for 9-11. And after that moment, there was a real shift in, I, I feel like the ways that brown bodies were painted. And there wasn't a lot of sophistication. Uh, you know, the uh, Iraqi was the same as the Turk, was the same as the Sikh. And, uh, and uh, you know, I certainly growing up in Northern Virginia, I felt racism, but I had never felt that kind of overt racism, particularly in a place I considered home um, until after 9-11. Then the other really interesting thing that happened, um, I think, was my treatment in the local media, Um, because I had these misdemeanor offenses, uh, and yet the Hartford Current published seven or eight articles about me. Uh, The local news, they sent uh, vans and television cameras. Uh, Is it a coincidence that I was one of the only faculty members of color uh, at the state institution? Uh, You know, there is a certain alliterative appeal I know in poet and professor promoted while in prison. But uh, when I found out about, I, I, you know, I, I, I know someone who used to run the Yale Writers Conference for many years and who was arrested and did time for embezzling over $500,000 and it didn't even make uh, any of the newspapers. And so who is covered? How is it covered? And I, I feel like, and I, I've heard this from other people in Connecticut who watched representations of me on the news and said, they made it seem like you were a wild animal, a gorilla escaped from the zoo, you know, on a rampage, this kind of out of control. What, would that same kind of depiction have happened to one of my peers? I, I don't know. Um, I can only kind of state my own Opinion, And then the other interesting thing that I experienced, and you heard a little bit of it in that section that I read, was the reverse racism, that when I was uh, at Hartford Correctional, you know, they called me uh, Abu Dhabi and Bin Laden and Osama. And uh, though, I mean, I came to realize that getting a nickname was a way of fitting in, and it meant that you were part of the community. Um, But um, I, I, I feel like what was exposed to me is a gulf between deed and rhetoric. I think that there's a lot of kind of, uh, you know, liberal guilt, and we can certainly like uh, like posts uh, about equality. And, and yet, if we're not actually actively engaged in the work of trying to fix some of these broken systems, then we're actually complicit in the harm and in, in, in the wrongdoing in some ways, you know? It's like a, a professor of uh, Marxism who is uh, drawing an enormous salary and, you know, writing about the ills of capitalism. And there's a certain uh, innate hypocrisy there, I think. And um, uh, I, I feel like um, there also is this, uh, and this is uh, maybe what many of us who have not encountered anyone who's been incarcerated. Well, I say in the book, of the American population is currently in prison, in probation, on parole. One in three African-American men will be arrested at some point in their lives. And so when you um, uh, feel like you can just um, summarily shut people out of opportunities or they pay their debt to society, but you'll never hire them because they have a criminal record while simultaneously recognizing that there is this a uh, system that is manifestly uh, unequal uh, in nature, I, you know, I think that that is uh, really pernicious. And um, I think that um, part of being intentionally inclusive is actually like I did, finding out about some of these men, finding out some of their stories, allowing the chance for redemption, forgiveness, growth, re-entry. That's the only thing that can make us a stronger society. Um, not shunning and shaming people, which is deeply embedded in the American character. 
You know, the Puritan ancestors really believed in shaming. And now in the social media era, it's easier than ever to kind of anonymously shame someone and troll someone. And is that ultimately getting us closer to our goal of um, shared humanity and uh, more equal society? You know, I, I don't think so. So um, yeah, I, you know, I, those are some of the lessons. Certainly there are a lot more as well, but. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so where do you see yourself going now as a writer? Do you feel as if um, this is an issue that you need to return to, that you need to contribute to in, in some kind of positive, meaningful way? Uh, or it, will it inform your poetry? Yeah, I mean, look, um, part of the work I did at the University of Sydney was um, I, I, I undertook a critical examination of prison memoirs written by American men of color, you know, starting with uh, Austin Reed, who wrote this great book, uh, just recently published The Life and Adventures of a Haunted Convict, that he wrote in the 1850s when he was uh, in prison upstate New York, um, all the way through uh, uh, Malcolm X and Mumia Abu-Jamal and Jimmy Santiago, Santiago Baca and even Little Wayne. You know, the rapper who wrote a prison memoir. And I, you know, and, and in terms of my engagement and social activism, I, I, I cannot unsee what I've seen. Um, so my heart is in that work and I know I will continue to do it. Aesthetically, um, I'm, I, I'm really uh, kind of exhausted and tired of myself, uh, <laughs> of kind of <laughs> revealing things about myself. So I, someone had asked me and I kind of joked that my next project is gonna be, uh, uh, erotic, fabulous, uh, uh, historical fiction noir or something, you know, something as far from the self as possible. But, you know, I would say, I mean, having read or written poetry and uh, written a lot of uh, critical stuff and reviews and now a memoir, you know, the one thing that's missing is fiction. So I may, I may have to talk to you a little bit about you know, <laughs> into a, a short story or novel, but yeah, I, I definitely not a transparently confessional uh and then you know it is when you do write a memoir like this it is um it's hard work and uh you reveal a lot and then you come out of it like you just did like eight rounds <laughs> with tyson or something at the very end so yeah um well i know it's been a long road um and uh, and, and i know that uh, currently uh there's this frustrating component of everything getting blocked up and the delay uh with uh with the book being released must be really frustrating so i i'm i'm with you in the in the hope that we get this thing uh materially in our hands very very soon um, uh, here you go you can pre-order it again weller books support your indie bookstore and i think that there will be a uh, uh i'll put it into the chat uh oh salem is going to put it into the chat where you can yes great yeah so uh this might be a good time to uh introduce a couple of questions from the from the gallery yeah um, well, yeah, thank you both so much for what's been a really terrific conversation so far. Really thoughtful questions and answers. Um, and I love that excerpt that Ravi read as well. It gave a really good sense of not only your own voice, but the voices of the people you encountered. And I really liked that. Um, and thank you, Tim, for your very gentle call out at the beginning. Also, please support Tim Tomlinson's work. And I will be leaving <laughs> link for this is not happening to you as well. Um, but this first question is just for Ravi. Um, how long did the book take you to finish from conception to the final draft? You talked a little bit about how you needed some time to process your experiences. Yeah, it, it took probably the better part of six years, I think. Uh, and initially I was naive enough to think that I could just kind of, you know, hash it out. And I had some uh, older essays. I, uh, I do use a little excerpt of, um, I wrote this essay that was published in the New York Times about sharing a name with India's most famous musician. <laughs> I made this kind of pastiche and it, it didn't hold together and readers felt like I wasn't. And I, you know, I, I think that part of this book is taking responsibility for my own mistakes. And I think those early drafts, I probably hadn't really reckoned with some of that, that material. Um, so, uh, and, um, you know, writing is a deeply collaborative process, as we probably know. So I have um, a terrific agent, Sarah Jane Fryman, and um, Tim, as it was one of the early readers, I had a lot of other friends who are writers and editors who read and gave me feedback. 
but I would put the book aside. I mean, I would put it aside for months at a time um, because I felt like each draft, I wanted to approach it in a really fresh way. And um, I was lucky enough to have a little bit of time um, 2016 at uh, Yaddo, uh, Artist Colony in Upstate New York, and then 2017 at the McDowell Colony and mm -hmm. for a month. And in both of those periods, I did an enormous amount of work. And then finally, this fellowship that I got at the University of Sydney um, allowed me funding. And as part of my PhD, I did this critical work, but I also wrote uh, uh, creative work and I finished the memoir during that time and got a great feedback from the, the faculty there too. So if I, you had told me it would take this long when I first started it, I, you know, I, I don't know how excited I would have been. And I, you know, every time I wanted to think that it was ready and it really needed more work, but I'm, I'm glad because it's a, it's a much stronger book because of it. Yeah, thank you. Um, let's see, um, this next question, I don't, I don't think really has an easy answer, um, but what do you think is the biggest misconception or one of the biggest misconceptions that the general populace has about our judicial system? Well, I think that um, I will say that it acts in our, our collective best interest is mm -hmm. probably the number one misconception that under the rhetoric of things like public safety, what has really been happening um, is, I mean, um, I, I like to quote the statistic that in 1979, there was about 250,000 people in jail. Last year, there was over 2.1 million. So, and this is our lifetimes, 1980 mm -hmm. to now an almost 1,000% increase because of the war on drugs, but a lot of this is actually kind of masking this uh, uh, a racist practice because of who is actually incarcerated. Um, mm -hmm. Should nonviolent offenders um, be incarcerated? No, is it, is it addressing the issues they have with substance abuse or mental health issues? No. And so I, I have come to believe, and I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but by any means, but there's a certain investment in the failure of the system because it's almost like the carceral system is this uh, mo rapacious monster that needs to be fed. And you bu build these jails and you need to put people in them. You expand police forces and give them more militaristic equipment and they're gonna need to justify that by arresting people and using it, right? And so the fact, I, I will just say that in, I think over the last um, 15 years or so, um, mo many states have spent in excess of four to five times more on incarcerating people than educating them. Mm -hmm. And so do we want our tax dollars to go to a system that is really broken? We have one of the highest recidivism rates of any developed country. I mean, you can look at models in Scandinavia where there's much more humane systems that are equipping people to reenter society. Well, mm -hmm. guess what? Their recidivism rates are really low. So why are we spending all of this money in a system that's broken, that's not keeping us any safer, um, so I think that is the number one misconception that actually it is helping us. It actually mm -hmm. collectively is hurting us all. Right, right. Um, and you know, this actually kind of leads into the next question, um, which is where, um, and I also don't think this is an easy question to answer, um, but where do you fall on the spectrum of prison abolition versus reform? Mm -hmm. um, and how about like, you know, the other aspects of our judicial system? Um, another way that that might be phrased is, do you believe that reform is possible for these structures? Mm. Such a such a difficult question. You're right. I mean, decarceration. Um, you know, I always like when I think about this. I like to look at the roots of um, the the uh, mass incarceration system, and it it was really the Quakers who were the liberal party of the mm -hmm. time that started it in response to this puritanical zeal for public shaming, for the sanguinary punishments, for uh, whippings and beatings and pillories and dunkings and executions. And they believed it was rightly, I think, a more humane alternative. Uh, and they believed that through labor and silence that these prisoners uh, could be redeemed. Um, you know, there are so many structural endemic problems um, and it, it feels like, uh, I think change can be enacted, but first of all, I think we need to become a more forgiving society uh, generally. And then we need to, um, 
so many of the, I mean, I feel like there, um, I, the analogy is almost like an enormous battleship that is like going in one direction and you're trying to get it to turn and everyone has to push and we can maybe split, but these changes because the, um, our legal system is rooted in those puritanical uh, laws and the constitution from 300 years ago, right? And so it takes a long time to make some of these changes, but, um, you know, in my experience, I, I just, I don't think incarceration is really very effective. Um, and I know that if you say, oh, you should abolish prisons, it sounds like you're a total anarchist and you believe in just like uh, the, the jungle law. But um, in fact, I think more money on social programming, on um, local community programming, on uh, mental health issues, on combating homelessness, I, I think that our money would be better spent in those directions personally. Well, thank you very much. Um, I just have one question left, um, and this is for both of you. Um, are you working on any other projects at the moment that you could tell us a little about? I'll let Tim take this one first. I am. I'm working on a new collection of fiction called Parentheticals. It's uh, comprised of uh, a number of um, kind of interlocking fragments uh, micro fictions, flash fictions, mm -hmm. full short stories, um, uh, monologues, rants and ravings, and uh, quite a bit of it uh, has already been published. Uh, I would say maybe a third, and I think another third is written, and another third needs to be. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, yeah, that's where I'm focusing most of my energy. At the same time, I'm writing poems, so I, I'm, I'm also kind of... Uh, Crossing Borders, um, and some of that, that work is uh, appearing as well. So I'm thinking book in both forms, uh, and hopefully in the next 18 months or so, I don't want to spend, I don't have six years to give these projects. Uh, so that's what I'm up to. Thank you for the question. Um, and I, I'll just say I do have um, a, a book of poems I've been working on for a while, um, and I'm there are poems in uh, 50 different forms. So I am particularly interested in bringing some Asian forms, um, which are easily as sophisticated and potentially canonical as a Sistina or a Villanelle. Um, so um, when we know maybe the haiku or the guzzle, but in the Rig Veda and Sanskrit uh, literature, there are literally hundreds of different poetic forms. So I've, I've brought some of those in. I've written some more traditional forms. I've invented a couple of forms of myself. <laughs> myself. And so I'm hoping that I'll write this kind of compendium of poetic forms, um, which is one, one project that I'm working on. And then I have this critical book uh, um, that I did for the University of Sydney that Rutledge Press is interested in. Um, but, you know, I, it was a lot of work going back into the um, Foucault and uh, <laughs> the post-structuralist theory. And I, you know, I, I don't know if I'll have the endurance to turn that into a book, but um, that is some, another project I have. Um, well, yeah, thank you again so much, both of you, for your time tonight. Um, do either of you have any closing thoughts that you'd like to leave the folks watching with? Um, well, I want to thank you for hosting us and presenting such a warm uh, setting. Um, and I want to thank uh, uh, Ravi. I've had Ravi come into my classes at NYU, and he's always... Uh, an illuminating presence. So um, thank you, Ravi, for the book. And thank you, everyone out there in the gallery for uh, giving us this time. Uh, and I will just say, uh, Tim is the executive director of the New York Writers Workshop. They're actually, um, we're hosting an immersive writing retreat in Athens. And the details are up on the New York Writers Workshop website. Uh, and you can um, follow me on the socials at Impurpler and also at Correctional Memoir. And uh, the the ebook is available, and the hard copy will be available. And I'm I'm glad to, you know, these conversations are really important, and I'm I'm really happy to just be part of starting some of these conversations. I'm glad to keep it going. So thank you so much, Salem, and thank you to the Humanities uh, Utah Humanities Festival and Weller Bookstore for for a great evening. Yeah, thank you both so much. This was an absolute delight. I hope you have a lovely night. Yeah, thank you, Salem. Take